Welcome to the Bill Cartwright Show with our co-host Steve Cohen, with our special guest, uh, family affair star, author, voiceover star, and public speaker, Kathy Garber. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Steve. Very happy to be here. Um, obviously, I watched you so much growing up, and uh, I talked to my wife, Sherry, and just having you on the show, uh, it, everybody loves you. It's oh, it's really incredible. Well, sometimes you you can talk to my husband of forty three years, and you know there may be some some down points. It's, I don't like this. Don't you have anything else for dinner we can have? But besides that, it's uh, most people I have been very kind throughout the years. Well, I, I feel like we know you, but let's start with this. Let's talk about where you grew up. And let's talk about your parents a little bit. I was born in Long Beach, California. And uh, then we moved to Baldwin Hills uh, when I was uh, 10 months old. My dad was an architect contractor. And so from Baldwin Hills, we went to Beverly Hills. And uh, I went to Beverly Hills Catholic School. And I started working actually professionally when I was seven. I started out with a movie called Night of the Hunter, which was this really kind of scary movie with Robert Mitchum and Shelley Winters and uh, Lillian Gish, Peter Graves. Billy Chapin was uh, Lauren Chapin's brother from uh, The Father Knows Best. It was an incredible cast. And it was directed by Charles Lawton. And this was the, the first movie he had ever directed. He was known as a wonderful actor. And uh, so he directed it and it got awful reviews. And he was so discouraged that he never made another movie. It turns out that this movie, which was really ahead of its time, has now become and recognized as one of the top 100 movies, horror movies that have ever been made. It was a psychological horror movie. So that's how I got, that was my first professional job. Uh, and then I went from horror to uh, wonderfulness doing the Ten Commandments when I was a child. And it had a wonderful director who had done many epics, uh, including you know, all the, but the Ten Commandments, this was not the silent version. I'm not that old, um, but it was uh, that. So that's, and I started when I was three, dancing and singing at the Meglin Studios. And that was a studio in Hollywood where they discovered Shirley Temple. So those those are my kind of claims to fame. Now, did you get started? Now, did your mom get you started? Or did you have a family member or somebody who was already in the business that got you started? Because that's very early. Yes, it is. Um, I happen to be the youngest of four children. And uh, my sister was this prodigy on the she was reading at three when that was many years ago not something that little kids do these days and she graduated UCLA at 19 she she entered 15 she skipped the first three years of school because she was really smart she was the oldest one and then I had two brothers and then I came along, I was kind of at a little mistake they they weren't planning on this fourth child but my mother had more time to spend with me. And at that, all those kids were from Oklahoma and they moved from the Dust Bowl times to California where I was born. So she had more time. And uh, I, I was, I had the influence of, of my older siblings. So that helps, I think you on the road. And I was very um, athletic when I was uh, young. And at three years old, I was doing the splits. I was doing cartwheels. I was doing all these things. At that time, again, my sister, oh, she can't go into this cartwheel stuff and acrobatics. She's not going to be in the circus. She was very adamant about that. But I was very athletic. And so I started dancing. And they said, oh, we'd have to put her in dance class. So that's when I started with three, because I was already very active in doing all those things. So talk about what kind of kid were you in high school and talk about your time at UCLA, which I'm very intrigued about. Um, I I started out at Emerson Junior High School 
in Westwood. And then we moved to San Bernardino. And I was grateful for that because I went to Pacific High School in San Bernardino and I am still like best friends with about 20 of my high school friends. Uh, but I was I was very smart. Uh, and again, I, I got this influence from my my sister. And so and I was in all the clubs and I was a cheerleader at, um, in high school. So, of course, then when I went to UCLA, I had to try out to be a cheerleader. And I was there during the era of um, Lou Alcindor and uh, Karim, J- Karim Abdul Jabbar. Yes. Uh, we always called him Lou. And I was up to like his belt. I am five foot one. And Lou, as you know, is like seven foot two. You're what, seven foot one? <laughs> you know, so mm-hmm. Hi there, Bill. How you doing? <laughs> Hi, Lou. But we, that was John, you know, John Wooden was a fabulous coach. And so I, I had some wonderful times and, and at UCLA was known so much for uh, their great basketball team, their football, you know, we always had the big rivalry with SC, SC would win football and we'd always win the basketball. Wow. You know, talk about that atmosphere because that was really at the peak of, of the championship years and, John won obviously one of the greatest coaches of all time. So you've really seen some really special, special people. Absolutely. And we had we had wonderful classes and great classmates. Unfortunately, there was a lot of turmoil at the time I was yeah. at UCLA. And I, I will remember the the assassination. And I was hurrying to class as usual, usually late. Uh, and then there was this fellow on the radio and he had it glued to his ear. And it was just such uh, a tragedy. Uh, so we were, you know, all concerned about what was going on in the world, and to have the sports and to have that uh, something else to see and to be involved in, and to something to win and to something to be brave for and persevere. It was it was very exciting. And I was in theater at UCLA, but I actually majored in speech. That's why I talk so much. I'm smart. But I majored in speech at UCLA and minored in psychology. So my psychology, you know, is like, well, Kathy, you know, you're you're really chatty. I said, I know, but I had a cup of tea this morning, a little caffeine. Um, but it was an exciting time to uh, to grow up in and be in the 60s and at UCLA and with all the energy that was going on then. So I believe when you're at UCLA, that's when Family Affair jumped in, uh, something that we watched growing up that we were really thrilled. So talk about that. And how did that happen? Well, I was uh, I was a Pi Phi, Pi Beta Phi at the sorority. And by that time, my family had moved back to Los Angeles. And I was in my third year of, of college. And I still had my childhood agent, Hazel McMillan who was a wonderful child agent. She was the mother of Gloria McMillan, who was on Armis Brooks, the radio show and the television show like back in the 50s. And she was really a wonderful agent, I must say. So here I am at the sorority. My mom calls and says, well, you have uh, an interview this afternoon for a series that's already been sold. And they have the cast. Brian Keith is starring in it. And they've got Sebastian Cabot and two little kids. But they need a teenage sister. And I says, oh, okay. And, uh, but she said, they want somebody with blonde hair. At that time, I did not have blonde hair. I had dark hair and uh, blue eyes. I had brown eyes, but I couldn't fix that. So, um, and they want to see you this afternoon. So I'm I'm in the sorority and my, my mom says, mom, you know, I have to be over in, in Westwood and, I know you're from Northern California, but Steve, I don't know where where you're based in L.A. or Northern California. Oh, no, actually in New York. But oh, yeah. you know, well, you know, traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I was going to say is trying to get across town from Westwood to Hollywood. So I says, Mom, come and pick me up. And, and they want someone with blonde hair. So my mom had this brilliant idea. I love my mom. I love my family. So she went to the drugstore and got me this stuff called streaks and tips. Now, you guys probably don't know about the streaks and tips and you don't know about hairspray, Steve. <laughs> Very true. Rub it in. <laughs> Just a little ribbing. Um, 
so she brought this stuff that you spray on your hair and it's supposed to change the color from like dark brown to, to blonde or whatever. So she sprayed my hair. I look like something out of Goldfinger. I mean, it, this brassy gold hair and, and you would knock on, it was like a, a helmet I, I was wearing, but we had to go. I dressed, they wanted a 15 year old, but you know, as you know, in pictures and film, they like to have an older, like an 18 year old playing any of the teenagers because they can work longer. The younger kids have to go to school for three hours and then they can only work for eight hours and they have to. So they prefer having someone that was 18. Well, I was actually a couple of years older than 18. I told them I was 18, however, I was 18. <clears throat> so I dressed up in looking like a 15 year old. I start to talk with the producer, cre uh, creator, director at Hartman. And I thought we were getting along just fine. Then he looked at my hair and he says, what's the matter with your hair? I said, my hair? See, we started this whole thing out about hair. And he said, well, it's turning green. I said, oh, is that funny? It must be the light or something. Ha, ha, ha. Well, anyway, it, it, it raised the, the temper of the room. And I did uh, then a... Uh, I, I appeared in front of the camera for a test and they said, okay, here's one more hair thing. They sent me to Max Factor in Hollywood and they put on this long blonde wig and then they outfitted me in this little blue and white checked pinafore. And I that's when I, when I did the test in. So go back to the sorority house. Three days later, my agent calls up and says, you have the job. She says, there's just one caveat, two caveats. I said, what's that? She said, never wear that dress again. And never wear that wig again. I said, you got it. And that's how I got family of hair. Can you talk uh, just briefly, because I'm sure you can talk a lot about your co-stars that uh, we watched so many years. Well, Brian Keith, of course, was absolutely fabulous. He was known as a macho man, and he had done some stuff with Charlton Heston and but when he did uh the parent trap they saw that he had this wonderful comedic kind of side to him so um he became the uncle Sebastian Cabot was a very formal kind of actor it was interesting because they had two different styles Brian was okay yeah what what do we have today all right yeah he'd read the script once script once and then they'd just do it Sebastian memorized every single word exactly as it was said and you know on over the weekend and so he got them all down so it was a nice dynamic and kids are kids um they have to you know hit their lines and say uh, and be as natural as they can and both uh Jody and Buffy were were very talented sweet little kids so that that was fine it was it was a very good cast now, did you have any special guest stars on, somebody that came on the show that you really um, admired or liked? Oh, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I know we'll probably get into this, but since you brought it up, uh, ah. this is my newest book, which is The Family Affair Scrapbook. And in the book, I have, uh, I turned exactly to it, notable guests. <laughs> so, you got um, So we had a lot of notable guests. Robert Reed was on it. Ida Lapino, who was absolutely fabulous. And she came back for uh, two more episodes. We were so enthralled with her. Um, we had, all, you know, all kinds of Vic Tabak. Uh, Heather Angel was uh, one of Sebastian's friends. She was uh, a, a wonderful movie actress. So, yeah, we, Lee Merriweather, who then became, I mean, there's, all kinds of wonderful guest stars that that we had, uh, and they they were always fun. So now um, your show's about to end. Talk about what did you feel like? Did you feel like you knew what was next, or did you feel like I have to, I've got to do something? Yes, I had no idea what to do. <laughs> so I decided. Oh, it was at that time that. Um, I was invited to go to Israel to do 
a Hebrew Israeli version of Family Affair, a musical. So they adapted some the the characters and and some scenes from Family Affair. And so I went on stage and I played myself. And then we had a full Mr. French and Uncle Bill. And so he was this nice Catholic girl, and I learned Hebrew for the whole thing. I can still remember these these songs. So when I was in Israel, I decided, well, here I am all the way across the pond. I think I'll go to London. So here, I was just in my 20s, but you're a little more adventurous, I think, in your 20s than you are when you get a little older. I would rather just sit inside and be, you know, talk to nice gentlemen and, and <laughs> at a podcast in your own house. Um, so I went to London, went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and uh, then I went back to uh, California, got my master's degree in theater arts, and then I started doing, this was at the time where they had dinner theaters. Oh, this is so weird. Okay, so I have a 32-year-old son that's going to be 33 tomorrow, uh, and he has never left home. He invited his girlfriend of now 11 years to live with us. But that's an aside. He took over like a, a portion of the garage and then another portion of the garage and my boxes were in there. And he says, you have to get rid of all these boxes, mom. They don't understand that this is our memorabilia. So anyway, three days ago, I was going through the boxes. I came across these, oh, here they come. Here was uh, a thing about plays. So those dinner theater plays that I was doing after I came back, I says, oh, here is the, uh, the Robinson Summerstock Theater. And I was going there, there, there I am. No, on the other side, this is a mirror. Doing Star Spangled Girl. And then I think Ed Burns is next from uh, another one. And then Carl Betts. And then, I forget who's at the end. Dwayne, yeah, Dwayne Hickman. So I don't want to throw these things away. So, but I have like more than one of them. <laughs> so... I got rid of them and I get this email about two hours later from this fellow that says, oh, hello, I'm I'm from uh, Illinois and I'm uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the uh, theater. And I was just wondering, do you have any do you recall anything about doing this play? You you did a play there and I and, <laughs> and Star Spangler, I said, you have got to be kidding me. I said. Just two hours ago, I'm getting all this stuff away to throw away. And I had an article about it. I have the, the thing. So the moral to this story is don't make your parents throw away their stuff. And so we're going. <laughs> so that's the moral. Steve, I'm going to give you a chance. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot here, uh, Kathy. I think one thing that you said that I found very interesting, and I know you've written books about child stars but you're in a sorority you get on this show and yet you become very famous and have this great career and yet why do you think you've been able to maintain all those friendships you know a lot of times people have jealousy or envy about people so what is it about you that makes all these people stay in your life and feel supportive of you I think that comes from my parents and also I I separated my life a lot from the the people that were in Hollywood and from my friends that I knew so well. And they were always very supportive. And a lot of times the friendships of like women you might make in the in the business are much more jealous uh, and competitive than friends that one became a lawyer and, and one became a pharmacist and you know, they pursued different careers. So I wasn't, and, and they were all very important to me because I really, my, I think just my persona, I am attracted to people just by their insides, who they are and the way that they treat other people and, and their, their kindness. And if I feel, I know we all have that inner sense and you know, if you like somebody like right away, or if you say, oh my God, I, this person may not be the best person for me to stay with. But I mean, I have friends since the first grade, Jeannie Gifford, who became a dental hygienist, and we were in the same sorority. And as I say, I had this coterie of friends, this, this 
20 of our, our high school friends and we just keep texting and we're, we're trying to keep up with all the technology and reunions that we had. And he says, well, we have to do many reunions. They're still my best friends. And um, and for ex-child stars, yes, you mentioned my book. So <laughs> this was my book, Ex-Child Stars. And uh, where are they now? I was very, very, very lucky because... Uh, again, of my parents that put down a nice foundation, they did not take all my money, as so many of the parents of child stars will do. They, um, I, well, I was going to say some people that I know, but you know, anyway, a lot of uh, the parents would use the money to pay for the other kids in the family or to help pay a mortgage or do something like this. Then the child gets to be 18 and well, excuse me, what happened to all my money? And that's only one part of it. The other part is being on drugs. So kids are usually in a child star. It's just, oh, let me fix your hair. Um, you know, oh, you need some makeup. I'm, I'll be your PR person. I'll take care of your legal things. I'll do it. They never develop the skills when they get older to know how to pursue their career. And I imagine, and that's in sports too, I would think, Bill, you know, because, you, you know, you're so, wow, look at how athletic he is. And in high school, he can do all this stuff. And you're put in a position where um, you don't have, maybe you haven't developed yet how to handle all those accolades and to handle all of that pressure and, you have to do well in this game or you have to do well on the set. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, I think, between this, the kids and uh, gentlemen that grow up and be stars and are able to make the transition nicely, you know, and, and be grateful and handle it because so many people just, just can't. So in a lot of the kids that I think that are in showbiz, they, they get on drugs and uh, the people around them are on drugs and they are depressed and they didn't get a job because it's one thing to be a cute little kid and be natural and say your lines. It's different than when you're a teenager, you're awkward, you're trying to find your identity, you're not getting all the jobs, you lost your series, what, you know, what do you do now? And so they join up with people that happened to the little girl in the show and the little boy. They they both got un into drugs and that's sad. And I I, I was very lucky that I never have uh, just because I'm crazy enough. And I, I don't want anything to make me feel anything more or, or sense anything more. I drink, I, li I like Chardonnay a lot, uh, but like drug drugs, I. You know, so I have been fortunate that way. I've been fortunate that my parents saved every single penny I ever made. And I had it all when I turned 18. So the, they're cautionary tales. And again, you know, with the sports, a, a young fellow or, or woman is given all this money all the time. It's says, wow, this is great. Let's spend it here. Let's spend it here. And they, you don't, they have not been taught like the business of sports or the business of acting. You know, they haven't taught show biz and they just, they're good actors, they're good athletes, but all those particular things, you have to have that other sense. And I think, I think I was reading something about you, Bill, where, you know, you, you went into the business world and you find that that's different, but it's also challenging and rewarding. Yeah, it is a good challenge, which is um, why I think a lot of athletes could do that because they can compete <laughs> I just want to ask you two questions. Uh, you do voiceovers, which I probably can't do. Uh, how did you get into that? And also, you do public speaking as well. What is your message? Well, my message in public speaking is the power of perseverance. And that we all have pitfalls and we all have obstacles, but you just keep on going. You go around it, you go over it, you go through it, but you get there. And uh, it's don't don't give up. And that's like Winston, you know, Churchill, never, 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 never. There's nine of them. Give up. And it's true, you know, because sometimes people are just, oh, I, I, I failed it or nobody like this. Yeah, that's OK. Pick yourself. This is President's Day. 
you know, and you see how many times did Lincoln fail? You know, he kept going. He kept going and going. And and so those are, I think, good things and, and reminders that even though you, you know, you don't do it the first time, you just try, you know, try, try again. And for voiceovers, I got into voiceovers from my commercial agents. And uh, I said, voiceover, I never heard of what that is. What does that even mean? They wanted this uh, voice for a tuna fish commercial. So my agent sends me out for this thing. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. So I go to Century City and I see the advertising agent. The fellow gives me the script. I know about scripts. And he says, just read this. I said, just read it? I said, oh, okay. I like tuna fish. It was like star kissed. So I like star kissed tuna fish. He says, oh, okay. Now read it a different way. What do you mean read it a different way? In a different voice. Read it in a different voice. What different voice? In my voice. No, okay. I like tuna fish. I like Star Kiss. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I didn't know how to do voiceover. So I immediately went out to find out how to do it. And I took some classes. Mel Wells, I took classes from. And I had majored in speech. So I, I knew all about nice speaking and then Shakespeare. But that is not necessarily what you need for voiceover. So... I actually became very confident in voiceover. <laughs> I've done like, I've recorded 80 audio books and I have, oh, and <laughs> I swear to God, I did not get these out on purpose to show you, but I'm trying to clean out my boxes for my son. But I cut, came up with, these are audio awards that I won for doing, um, for doing audio books. And I'm the voice of Firestar. Oh, here she is. I keep myself surrounded by myself. This is my character, Firestar. My my son ran over her. Unfortunately, she was in a box, um, but in the garage. <laughs> That's why he wants me to get everything out. So this is Spider-Man and his amazing friend. So I'm the voice of Firestar and her alter ego, uh, Angelica Jones. And I've done like five animated series. And I do a lot of commercials with voiceover. I also just still do regular commercials. It's, it's my philosophy, and especially you know, as you get older, just to keep yourself busy, but also, and I taught, <clears throat> excuse me, I taught for about 20 years for voiceover, how to do animated characters, how to do audio narration, how to do um, real people commercials, because the more skills you have, the more things you're able to do. So, and as you know, you know, you're going to practice a different um, movement to make a basket, you're going to practice a different thing. I mean, I when I was in San Francisco, and of course, we'd always watch the Warriors, and and they were so cool because they faked, they faked all the. I've never seen the team fake so much, in my estimation, as as the Warriors, because they would go and and then they they'd make the the pass to to somebody else. And also, I think I was reading something about you, Bill, and um, oh, what was his name? Ah. I was going to say, you know, the real tall one. Um, <laughs> he actually lived around the corner from me on Mulholland. But that you guys didn't go to intimidate. You went there to play the game. You went there with your skill sets and your abilities to play the game. That's my sports thing. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a very good scouting report. We're going to have to, that's going to be your next uh, next job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I. I was trying to think which basketball player did live around the corner from you. Was it a teammate of Bill's? Was it Kareem in LA? It wasn't. Or... It wasn't Kareem, but right. he lived right right off of Mulholland as you're going down um, uh, Benedict Canyon, which is now okay because of the floods. Um, oh, I'll think of it like at three a.m. Yeah. Or you know, after we're after we're done. Yeah, I remember we're... because he had his whole house refitted too to to make things taller like ceilings and and everything not wilt chamberlain right yeah. oh no no in between <laughs> wilt it was it wasn't wilt it, it was after wilt but I yeah don't. yeah and have you, have you have you run into kareem over the years or bill walton and at ucla events or any of that stuff i've, I've run into kareem a couple times yeah and and uh said hi and they're very nice, you know, very, very uh, giving people, I think. Um, 
you know, Kathy, I, you said you've been married for 43 years. I happen to be married for 44. Oh, you beat me. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Sometimes it's so. <laughs> so what do you attribute your longevity in marriage? Well, we're pretty, we're pretty balanced. It is, you know, it's interesting. It is a little bit like sports because we don't try to get too high and too low. We're all on the same team. And um, we just want to be happy. And I'm um, probably similar to you that uh, there's no retirement in me. I want to keep going, keep moving, keep creating. Uh, if I can help um, somebody else um, along with their journey, that would give me a lot of pleasure. So uh, just use that experience. And your experience is just really amazing. It's really inspiring it's got to be to a lot of young ladies who have a dream and to be able to pursue that dream. So um, um, interesting uh, that I feel like we're very similar in uh, what we're trying to accomplish. But to go back to that, let's talk about your husband a little bit. You can't leave him out. Yeah, he's a nice. I was thinking, I wonder why we've been married so long. I said, because I like him. You know, I, I I do. He is he is a very kind person, and he's and he's pretty laid back, and he's much kinder than I am because I can get angry, you know, and it, and I'm in, impatient with people. It's on. He says it's all right. They'll they'll come around. It's okay. So he's kind of like a, a nice influence on me, and he's supportive. And I'm sure your wife is. I mean, they they have to like you <laughs> too for it to go on for a long time. But yeah, I've been doing affirmations. My uh, my son with it because I have this influence of these thirty three year olds. Well, she she'll be thirty three next month, um, and it's nice to see what they are involved with. And she turned me on to affirmations. So she's she has a little bit of Indian American Indian in her, and so she's this spiritual kind of. She sages the house. She taught me about affirmations. But it made me think of one of the affirmations too is, you know, you put you put yourself out there and the universe is just infinite and, and don't think that don't don't be ashamed to make money. It's a it's a good thing. There's enough for everybody. And the more you make, the more you can help other people bring them in to what you're doing. And I am working on a couple projects, I must say. And I says, well, as I so, you know, as soon as I get the final monies in for that, then I can invite this person to be an actor in it, or you know, perhaps this person can be a makeup person, or or whatever. So I think you just have to, even when you're down the most, is nothing can make me be positive. Yes, that can just smile. I mean, then that's a it's silly little thing, but that's one of the after. Just you get up in the morning, oh, I think I'll smile, and it it, it has a nice little influence on your whole body. Yes, and your whole body and others. Steve, I'm going to give you the last shot of this. No, I'm I'm just I'm really pleased that you were able to join us. I think that I I we did want you on because I think Bill is a big fan of yours and you are kindred spirits. Bill is always extremely positive. He doesn't like negativity. He always says like don't make sense of nonsense and just to be very positive and I imagine that's part of your ethos, but could you just tell us a couple of messages you've given your speeches about perseverance? Well, as I said, um, when you you were down a little bit, you just uh, remember good thoughts. Um, you put up your goal and every day you take a little step forward to, I think we're all here for some reason. And uh, I mean, I, I think my reason is maybe to inspire people or just to use, I'm going to use up all my talents. Like I'm sure, you know, Bill and, and you too, Stephen are going to, you've gotten so many talent, you know, one has talent. So you're going to utilize them all the way. Don't, don't waste them. Would you like to know what I'm doing now? That's for sure. And we have okay. a couple of movies, right? Yeah. I just finished a movie called Christmas at the Roanoke Ranch, which was really interesting uh, we shot it in Michigan, and the producer wanted to do it in Michigan because it snows there. And there had just been a blizzard, and 
Uh, it was eight degrees. Oh, okay. I, said, <laughs> I went to this to uh, Costco and got all these sweatshirts and leggings, and then we got there, and it's uh, it was like eight, eight degrees. And the day the the last week, thirty five degrees, forty degrees. All the snow has almost melted. So he was a bit. He was not set. You know, he's upset about that. But we did all the inside uh, scenes, and just yesterday. He he got a double for me, and uh, they did the outside uh, scenes because it did snow and it was eight degrees, and I'm glad that it was forty degrees when I was there. But it's a wonderful story about therapy horses, uh, about a horse sanctuary, and how the horses can be um, used for people with PTSD and for at risk kids. Um, and so it the the movie really mirrors this. Uh, actual ranch, which is called the Roanoke Ranch for kids. And so that was just another thing that things come together for a reason. You may not know what the reason is, but there it was. I mean, why did I have these things right right here that I that I could show you, you know, at that particular time? Because they're just we we live for those moments and just gotta trust the universe to to take care of you. So I have Christmas at Roanoke Ranch. Just that came out is Yellowbird and Old Man Jackson, those are all on Amazon Prime. And uh, I'm going to do a movie called Good Times at Blue Jay Saloon, where Dolly Parton comes in at the end. So that's that's going to be a really a nice movie. And as soon as we can get the rest of the money, uh, we're doing a movie in Australia uh, called Pollyanna's Wish, based on the the original book of, of Pollyanna. So those those are my movies. And people can go to my website kathygarver.com and get any one of my five books. I have two new books coming out. This one's called Romancing with the Stars. I do that with Doug Hartland as my co-writer on that one. And we've done all these interviews. Guy, we should do you, Bill, of, of long-term uh, relationships and marriages and why they were and what was where where were they, what was the the place that they uh, they found that was the most romantic in their lives. And then we give like a little travel guides for them. So that's that book will be out in April and uh, TV Dinners TV. So anyway, that's my life. <laughs> wow, amazing. Very secretive. <laughs> amazing. Well, Kathy, we want to thank you so much for being on. You're, you're, you're a very special person. You've had a great journey. And it's still going on. So thank you so much for being on. And Steve and I are both going to purchase. I don't know. I got to. I got to think about it because I have six sisters and my wife. So I think if you'll sign them, I think we need everyone to have a copy of your book. Oh, that would be wonderful. I'd appreciate that. And thank you so much for inviting me. You were both just charming. And I'm, I'm so happy to, to talk with you.